Okay, we're happy to have Matt Reese from Harvard, who's going to give us a swampland tour from global symmetries to axion physics. Okay. Are my slides showing up for you? Yep. Okay, good. So thanks for the invitation. Um, some of you may have heard parts of this talk before, um, but it, some of you haven't. So this is based on work I've been doing recently. Um, I've been working for a few years now with Ben Heidenreich, who's now a professor at UMass Amherst, and Tom Rudelius, who's now a postdoc at Berkeley. Um, and we had a recent paper that was the three of us plus three new collaborators, uh, Jake McNamara, who's a student of Cameron Baffa at Harvard, and Miguel Montero and Irene Valenzuela, who are currently postdocs at Harvard. Uh, that paper just came out earlier this month. and, and um, But some of what I'll tell you about is other stuff that's been happening over the last few years. And uh, we also still have some ongoing work in progress uh, that I might, well, I, actually, I think I probably won't tell you much about the work in progress, but we have more things that we're, that we're doing. Um, so here's the outline of the talk. I'm, I'm first going to tell you what I mean by this phrase, the Swampland Program. And I want to try to summarize uh, my viewpoint on what's been happening over the last several years with our understanding of that and the weak gravity conjecture. Um, and then I'm going to move on to, to the other parts of my talk, which are going to be uh, based on trying to explore this idea of generalized global symmetries. So the concept of generalized global symmetries came from uh, a paper by um, Gaioto and Kapustin and Seibert and Willard a few years ago. And I think this is a really uh, powerful idea that we haven't uh, completely understood all the uses of so far, but I want to sort of sketch what their idea is and how it relates to some of the things I'll tell you about, about the weak gravity conjecture. And then in the third part of the talk, I'll introduce a family of these generalized global symmetries that we've specifically been playing with recently that we call churn vague global symmetries. And, um, and try to at least suggest a way that this might connect to some ideas that are useful for, for phenomenology. Um, there's nothing super, uh, precise about that yet, but there are some qualitative things that I think uh, point in interesting directions. Okay, so what is the swampland? It's an idea that, uh, a, a phrase that came from Kamran Vafa back in 2005. And the idea is that uh, we have many different kinds of effective field theories that make sense. And any effective field theory that has a stress energy tensor can be perturbatively coupled to gravity. But we don't have that many theories of quantum gravity that are UV complete that we really understand. And so Cameron proposed this picture where the set of quantum gravity vacua is sort of various small corners, maybe some isolated vacua or some moduli spaces that live inside some much bigger space of effective field theories. And he proposed that uh, most of these effective field theories actually have no UV completion and, and they're called the swampland. And the idea of the swampland program is to try to find some criteria where you can point at some big region like the thing pictured in red here and say, no effective field theory in this region could possibly have a UV completion um, because it violates some sort of principle. And so the, the goal is to try to characterize this, this, uh, these dividing lines between theories that potentially make sense and theories that don't. And my reason for being interested in this is coming, coming from the direction of particle phenomenology. When I talk to people who do uh, string theory model building, meaning people who study string uh, string constructions that give you a Lagrangian for particle physics that you can stare at. Um, it seems like no matter how people arrive at these things, whether they're doing heterotic strings or type two strings or M theory or what, they seem to find a lot of sort of common features that are interesting to me as a, as a particle physicist. And so like one thing that seems to happen very generally is that if I have gauge fields, um, I tend to find axion fields that couple to FF dual. So that's something that seems to happen in all these different ways of constructing gauge theories within string theory. There are things that I tend never to find, like a photon that has a super tiny mass, um, or rather maybe I can find a photon that has a super tiny mass, but I can only find it in a theory that also has a super low cutoff. So there's some sort of premature breakdown in the effective field theory when I find such a thing. Um, a thing that I won't have anything to say about in the talk, but that I think is uh, a super interesting fact is uh, these different corners of string theory tend to give you light matter that only comes in small representations of gauge groups. And so I, I don't know if there's a principle behind that, but it's an interesting fact that you could imagine, you know, detecting a particle at a, at a collider that would be very hard to fit into any known string compactification. 
And we also tend to find scalar fields like moduli fields uh, that are weakly coupled, uh, whose BEVs determine the values of coupling constants. But their field ranges typically tend to be sort of a order of the Planck scale, but not much bigger than the Planck scale. And that's interesting from the point of view of thinking about building models of inflation that might give you detectable uh, primordial gravitational waves, for instance. So a lot of these just kind of collections of things that people say about what they find in string compactification seem very interesting to me. And what I would like to know is how seriously should I take them? Is this, is this an artifact of the fact that people only know how to do quantum gravity in a few of these little corners of theory space? Um, or are there deep principles behind these things and we should think these are robust facts about the way quantum gravity works? So those are the questions that I would like to have answers to. And I think that what's been happening over the last several years is at least for some of these questions, uh, we're starting to get some idea of what the principles might be and not just looking under lampposts. And so I'm going to focus in this talk on um, a set of these swampland ideas, which are all related to the common theme that there are no global symmetries and theories of quantum gravity. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. Um, but I think one thing that, that uh, some of us have started to appreciate in the last few years is that this statement that there are no global symmetries is very old. It goes back at least to the 70s um, to, to um, Hawking and, and others thinking about black hole physics. But um, I think that the, the idea that there are no global symmetries actually has, has a lot more teeth than you would have thought initially. It's a, it's a stronger statement. And part of that is because we've sort of been appreciating that the idea of a global symmetry is actually a bigger concept than, than we'd appreciated. And a lot of that is due to the work that I mentioned before of Gaioto and collaborators. So I'm going to introduce some of those ideas. Um, they're kind of formal field theory ideas, uh, but I think they have a role to play in the real world. Some of these ideas already are, are used in condensed matter theory a lot, and I think they'll start to be more important in particle physics. So this idea that there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity, um, there are various versions of it of varying degrees of concreteness going back for decades. Um, for instance, in perturbative string theory, there's a very precise statement that goes back to work of Tom Banks and Lance Dixon in the 80s that says if you have a perturbative uh, world sheet string theory and you think you have a global symmetry, you can actually construct a gauge boson that couples to that symmetry current and see that it wasn't really global, but it was actually gauged all along. But I think the, the intuition that a lot of people have about this really comes from thinking about black holes and, and again goes back to, to um, Hawking and others in the 70s where the idea is roughly just that if you imagine having some uh, global symmetry like baryon number, you would think, why can't I just throw baryons into black holes and make the baryon number disappear? And one version of that argument that's relatively sharp was, was written down by Banks and Seiberg uh, about 10 years ago. And their version of the argument is that uh, if I tell you that I have some U1 global symmetry, you could imagine taking things that are charged under that symmetry and throwing them into black holes. And maybe you imagine that this really is a symmetry of the whole theory, which means the black holes are labeled by some global symmetry quantum number. You can't measure it. There's no hair associated with it outside the black hole. There's no electric field because it's a global symmetry. But still, you imagine that somehow the black hole remembers its charge and, and it is a good quantum number. But the, the trouble that you run into is you can make really big black holes with really big charge and just let them gradually evaporate and shrink to smaller sizes. And at some point, their size is going to become of order of the cutoff and you stop trusting Hawking. But for black holes of that size, you can imagine getting any charge that you like, arbitrarily big charges, if you just started with enough charge in a big enough black hole and let it evaporate. And the puzzle there is that it seems like you can now get infinitely many different states of infinitely many different charges that all have kind of the same size. And that seems like it violates uh, black hole thermodynamics or holography or lo lots of general principles that suggest that there's a uh, finite amount of entropy associated with a given size of a spatial region. So this looks like there are infinitely many different states you could pack into that region if you have a global symmetry. Um, so this isn't really a proof of anything. I mean, you, you would have to really have a, a rigorous uh, argument about these finite entropies, but it's at least an argument that a global symmetry would be in tension with a lot of things that people believe about how gravity works. And more recently, there, there is something that actually claims to be a proof, which is a, a paper by Harlow and Aguri that came out uh, a little more than eight, uh, two years ago, um, where they uh, give an argument specifically, specifically for asymptotically ADS spacetime. So they're not claiming that this is completely general. Um, 
but what they argue is that uh, basically th there's a way to apply some of these recent ideas about holography and entanglement wedge reconstruction to argue that the operators that would sort of measure the charge of something actually commute with anything that lives sufficiently deep in the bulk. Um, because you can sort of divide these operators up into products of things that only know about limited regions. And so you can argue that the operator is sort of insensitive to things in the middle of the bulk. And that means you really can't have anything that's actually charged in the bulk under the symmetry operators. So that's that's a caricature of the argument. It's a like 150 page paper they wrote. So I don't have time to try to explain the argument in any de detail. And I don't think I even understand all the details of the argument. Um, but that's the, that's the rough uh, sort of slogan behind it. So the claim is that they can prove that there are no global symmetries in, in asymptotically ADS quantum gravity, and not just for continuous symmetries like the ones that the Banks and Cyberg argument applies to, but for absolutely anything, discrete global symmetries, higher form global symmetries, <clears throat> which I'm going to define in, in a little bit. Um, so they claim to have a completely general argument as long as you accept holography and asymptotically ADS quantum gravity. Okay, so, um, so there are supposed to be no global symmetries in theories of quantum gravity. And um, as, as a particle physicist, that statement to me is not obviously very interesting because it's not very quantitative. It tells me I can't have a, an exact symmetry, but most of the time what I care about is whether I can have an approximate symmetry, right? Like we know protons are very stable in the real world and uh, it would be very interesting to know that they have to decay, but uh, to really put that to use and compare with experiment, we want to know how fast they have to decay. So we really want to try to quantify some of these things better. And um, one attempt to quantify what goes wrong in one way of trying to get an approximate global symmetry is the weak gravity conjecture, which is due to our Connie Hamed model, Nicolas and Baffa from 2006. And they asked the question, you know, what happens if I imagine having a very weakly coupled gauge theory in the context of quantum gravity? So it's not a global symmetry, but it's a super weak gauge interaction. And if it's weak enough, maybe that's kind of almost indistinguishable from a global symmetry. And maybe you would think something bad should happen when you do that. And um, that kind of motivated their conjecture. I can't actually give you a strong argument for the conjecture because they don't really give one. They kind of give various plausible reasons to suspect something like this might be true, but none of them are super convincing arguments. But what they say is that maybe there should always be a particle whose mass is less than its charge in quantum units. And what I mean exactly by that is that there should be a particle whose mass to charge ratio is not something that's allowed for a black hole, for a Reissner-Nordstrom black hole, um, or generalizations of Reissner-Nordstrom black holes in theories that have massless scalars. And one argument for that is if that wasn't true, um, every extremal black hole would be stable. Extremal black holes are those whose mass is equal to their charge in Planck units. If it's going to be able to decay, it has to be able to decay just kinematically to some daughter particle whose mass is smaller than its charge. And the reason they called this the weak gravity conjecture was the idea that if this is true, if I take two of these particles whose mass is smaller than their charge, they're going to repel each other because the gauge force between them is uh, stronger than the gravitational force. And so weak gravity here means that gravity is a weaker force than the gauge force for this specific kind of particle. Um, so really there are two different ways of formulating the conjecture. One is the way they uh, mostly formulated originally that there should be particles that are super extreme all that have mass to charge ratios that are not allowed for black holes. A different way to formulate it would be that some particle has has to exist, which when you take two of those particles far apart, they repel each other. And these two conjectures are completely equivalent if you um, assume that the only forces you need to worry about are gauge forces and gravity. They're not equivalent if you have massless scalars because those, those can mediate additional long range forces that are attractive and might, um, might behave differently in these two different contexts of black holes and of just these two particles that are far apart. Um, so there are actually kind of two distinct conjectures, which in certain cases collapse onto each other. And one interesting thing that uh, my collaborators and I, but also Aaron Palti and others have explored over the last few years is that it seems like both of these are actually true in all the examples we know. And um, that's somewhat mysterious because 
you might think one of these conjectures is more fundamental than the other, but even when they don't agree with each other, they both seem to be true. Okay, so that was their conjecture. But again, like the statement that there are no global symmetries, this conjecture is not super useful. Um, and the reason is that it just tells you that something exists whose mass is less than its charge. And so the question is, what is that something? And if that something is a light particle, maybe it's interesting to particle physicists, but that something could also be a big black hole. And at first that sounds like a contradiction because black holes have an extremality bound, so the mass cannot be smaller than their charge. But the extremality bound is something you derive from Einstein-Maxwell theory from the, the action with only two derivative terms included. And we believe that that's always just some effective field theory approximation to some underlying theory that has more stuff going on. And so you could look at what happens if you add, for instance, four derivative terms to your action, and there are several of those that you can add. And um, going back to, to work of Katz and collaborators around the time that, that the original weak gravity conjecture paper came out, it was notice that if these various higher dimension operators have uh, coefficients that obey a certain inequality, um, they will correct the extremality bound in such a way that the black holes themselves become a little bit lighter than the two derivative extremality bound allows. And so you could interpret that to be saying that the black holes themselves obey the weak gravity conjecture because they get pushed in this direction where they're slightly lighter than they otherwise would have been. And in the last several years, there are, there are several different papers that have argued that in fact, that inequality that these coefficients need to satisfy is obeyed in every theory that is well behaved. So people have tried to argue based on unitarity or um, based on some entropy arguments that these coefficients always obey that inequality. And um, I don't find any one of these arguments to be completely rigorous. Uh, they, they all sort of sneak in some assumptions that you can question, but there are several different arguments from several different directions and they all point at the same answer, which makes it seem at least likely that that, that answer is true, which is that in consistent theories, the weak gravity conjecture just is obeyed by big black holes that get small corrections. And so again, um, that kind of goes in the direction of saying that some of these older conjectures are not very useful on their own because they're just if all it's telling me about is that some big black hole gets a tiny correction, that's not something I care a lot about as a particle physicist. Um, so what we would really like is some stronger statement, something that really has power to constrain the effective field theory at low energies. And um, there were some postulated strong weak gravity conjecture statements in the original paper, and we now know that basically all of those are, are false. Um, except for, for one statement, which was called the magnetic weak gravity conjecture in the original paper. And um, that was basically the statement that the scale of, of the charge of a particle in Planck units uh, should be interpreted not just as uh, some mass scale below which you have to find a particle, but a UV cutoff on the theory in some strong sense that the, not just that some new particle has to come in before that scale, but that the theory as an effective field theory of a U1 gauge field coupled to gravity has to somehow break down dramatically by, by that scale. Um, one way that could happen is if it's embedded in a non-abelian theory, for instance, but something you know, qualitative has to happen that, that changes the way the theory behaves. And they argued this based on some, some ideas of thinking about magnetic monopoles and thinking that the, the, the sort of radius of the magnetic monopole should be some sort of UV cutoff on your theory. And what we've learned in the last uh, few years is that first, the statement seems to be true in, in every corner of the string landscape that people know how to do calculations in. So, so there is a UV cutoff. If you try to make the gauge coupling small and in that sense, restore an approximate global symmetry, the theory will sort of fight you by dragging the cutoff down and, and not giving you much room to talk about how the theory behaves. Um, and what we've understood is that the theory tends to break down in a very specific way, which is that um, when you hit the scale of the gauge coupling times M Planck, you always find towers of particles. So a good example is kaluza quine theory, where you just have towers of KK modes. Um, but it seems to be a generic feature. And whenever you have towers of particles, you tend to have a, an effective field theory that breaks down because all of these particles can start running in loops 
So one version of this idea is an old idea called the species bound and theories of gravity, that if you have many different particles that are weakly coupled and talk to gravity, um, they can run in loops and correct the graviton propagator and your cutoff has to be well below the Planck scale. Um, where by the Planck scale, I mean the scale you measure from measuring Newton's constant at long distances, uh, the fundamental cutoff has to be way below that. And what we found is that something like that seems to be true for, for gauge couplings as well. If we have gravity theories that have very weak gauge couplings, then we get towers of charged particles of many different charges and they all run in loops. And so they drive the theory to strong coupling in the UV at some scale that's way below the Planck scale. And um, not only that, but, but there's some kind of correlated feature here where if the, um, if the gauge theory breaks down at energy scales that are below where gravity becomes strongly coupled uh, due to loops of particles, you can actually argue that these particles have to obey the weak gravity conjecture. So in that sense, the, the weak gravity conjecture is some condition that's guaranteeing that when you hit the scale where gravity becomes strongly interacting, everything else is becoming strongly interacting too. And so that motivated- so How does uh, this work with cyborg witten So in the case of cyborg witten um, you could have your gauge theory approach strong coupling even sooner, right? So, so, so what this is saying is that your gauge theory should always become strongly coupled uh, by the time you hit the gravitational cutoff, but it might do it below that. So you might hit strong coupling, go to some other description that's weakly coupled, but then that description should also hit strong coupling before you hit the gravitational scale. So maybe that other theory that you reach in the UV would have its own towers of charged things that would come in. But the, the infrared coupling of the massless monopole is zero. Right, so that's, that's a slightly tricky thing about the weak gravity conjecture in four dimensions, um, which is that because the coupling runs, um, if you have a massless charged particle, as you said, in the, in the deep IR, your coupling goes all the way to zero. And so if you were saying there was a tower of particles whose mass is always less than the IR coupling times M Planck, you would be wrong because you would say you should have an infinite tower of things whose mass is zero and that's false. You just have a finite set of things whose mass is zero. Um, so what, what the conjecture really should say is some sort of renormalized statement where there's a tower of particles whose mass is less than some running coupling evaluated at the scale of their mass times M Planck. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we don't, we don't understand that point as well as we should. Um, most of the examples we have where we can really check this quantitatively and we fully understand it are in five or higher dimensions. So we don't have the log running that we have in four dimensions. So yeah, I, I think there, there's certainly both, both cyborg duality and just generally what's the, what's the right way to state this conjecture taking into account our G flow. Um, are issues that are not understood as, as well as I would like them to be. But if we, um, especially if we work in higher dimensions where the gauge coupling is just some dimensionful quantity, um, we have a lot of checks of this. And so, so we propose some of these versions of the weak gravity conjecture that require infinitely many particles to start appearing at, at this, uh, at the scale of gauge coupling times M Planck. And, those kinds of statements have now been checked in many different corners of, of the string landscape. And so this is just a partial list of references from the last few years. Um, ben and Tom and I started checking this in just like heterotic string, uh, perturbative heterotic string compactifications and other people uh, with much more powerful geometric tools like uh, Lee, Lersch and Weigand have checked it in F theory. Um, so I don't, I don't even understand most of the details of those papers, but they say that, that the F-theory compactifications obey the same kind of things. And in fact, they've even made a stronger conjecture, which is they say that at least they, they only find two kinds of towers of particles. Um, one is the tower of KK modes where you take some extra dimensions and you blow them up and decompactify. And the other is a, a limit where you take some internal structure in your, in your compactification and you shrink it and you can wrap something on it. And as it shrinks, it becomes a tensionless string. And so they've, they've made an even stronger conjecture, which they call the string emergence conjecture, um, 
that every weak coupling limit in quantum gravity is either a decompactification limit or a tensionless string limit. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't have to be true for the rest of this to be true, but it's interesting that kind of the menu of options that they find um, is so limited. Okay, so that was the first part of the talk. I just wanted to, to give you this idea that the direction we've been moving in with, the, with these questions is um, trying to take these conjectures and, and figure out versions of them that are both true and examples that we know um, and that seem kind of motivated by some qualitative reasoning, which here is like this reasoning about things being driven to strong coupling at some common uh, scale. Um, and, and that are maybe more powerful than the original conjectures, which are just too weak to have anything useful to say about particle physics. Um, so before I move on, maybe I should ask if there were any other questions about that part of the talk. No. Okay, so let me move on then. I wanna introduce this idea of generalized global symmetries and um, to do it, it's useful to remind you of the mathematical language of differential forms. Um, which is at least for, for those of us coming from the phenomenology direction, not usually the way that we write things, but um, it turns out to be really useful for this. So if I was writing a conserved current, I would usually say that there's some vector and the divergence of this vector is zero. But an equally good way to write that is to form a D minus one form. So this is an anti-symmetric tensor with D minus one indices and a theory of D space-time dimensions, which I get by contracting my original vector with an anti-symmetric uh, epsilon symbol. And the statement that the current is conserved becomes the statement that this form is closed. So the exterior derivative, which is just the anti-symmetrized partial derivative acting on this uh, is equal to zero. And so um, I'm going to be sort of interchangeably talking about closed forms and conserved currents. And one reason that this is useful is a, a differential form kind of by definition is something you can integrate. And that's the thing that we do with currents. We integrate them over some slice of space time to get charges. And so in this language, you see that you don't necessarily have to just take a, a slice at fixed time. You can integrate over any D minus one dimensional submanifold of a Euclidean space time and define some charge. And you can also gauge the current. Um, the usual gauging where we dot a gauge field into a current becomes this anti-symmetric wedge product of the gauge one form with the D minus one form conserved current. And if you use that notation, you can rewrite Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equation tells you that D of star F, where F is the two form field strength associated with this gauge field A is equal to J. And so what you should observe about this equation is that it tells you that J is exact, meaning it's a D of something else. So that's a stronger statement than the statement that dj is zero. Um, and if dj is zero, but j is not exact, we would say that we have a global symmetry. We have a conserved current. But when j is exact, the symmetry has been gauged. And so we've taken what was a, a global symmetry and we've turned it into a gauge symmetry. And um, I've been sloppy here with square roots of determinant of g, but all these differential form equations on the right are correct as they are without inserting anything else. So all the sloppiness is on the left-hand side. And so um, we can integrate these currents over slices of space-time to get charges. And in the quantum theory, we can get operators that are associated with these charges. And in fact, um, there's a whole family of operators. Oops. Uh, there's a whole family of operators which are associated with elements of the gauge group. So if my gauge group is U1, my elements of the gauge group are of the form e to the i alpha. So I have some family of operators labeled by alpha and labeled by the slice of space time I'm integrating over. And these take the form of e to the i alpha integral of the current. And these operators have the property that they're topological. And so in this language, that's really sort of one of the defining features of a, of a global symmetry is it's associated with a family of topological operators. And what I mean by topological is if I compute a correlation function that involves this operator, I can take this manifold M and I can bend it and twist it however I like. And as long as I don't make the manifold cross through some place where I inserted a charged operator, my correlator won't change. 
And so pictorially, um, you could imagine having a local operator V, which is charged under our global symmetry. And if I move V across the surface over which I'm inserting this operator, I pick up a phase, which is associated with the charge Q of the operator. Um, it's the group element raised to the, to the power Q. OK, so, so this is just um, for, for symmetries like U1, this might seem like kind of an overly elaborate way of saying things that are kind of familiar. We could just talk about the current itself and its correlation functions. But one reason why this language is really useful is it also works for discrete symmetries. So for a discrete symmetry, I don't have any local conserved current. And so you might think I can only define a charge by integrating over all of space. But actually, we can still define charge operators associated with these submanifolds of space time, even if they're kind of small submanifolds. And um, to sort of illustrate that, um, there, there's this generalized version of this where instead of just thinking about symmetries that act on local operators, we could think about symmetries that act on Q dimensional uh, operators. So these could be ordinary local operators when Q equals zero, or they could be operators that live on lines like Wilson lines if Q is one. Um, they could be operators that, act, that, that live on surfaces if Q is two and, and so on. And if you have Q-dimensional charged operators, you can always link them. You can, you can surround them by, by some sphere, which is D minus Q minus one dimensional. And what happens with these symmetries is if you shrink that symmetry operator down around the place where you inserted the charged operator, um, if it's U1, you just multiply by a phase, but more generally, you multiply by some representation of whatever your global symmetry group is. And this is the basic idea of generalized global symmetries. Uh, it was introduced uh, about six years ago by Gaioto and collaborators. And so they defined a p-form global symmetry as something that has these topological operators associated with elements of a gate, uh, sorry, of a global symmetry group and the manifolds that you integrate over, p-dimensional charged operators that can be linked with these charge operators um, in the way that I just showed. And these operators should obey a group law. So if I take two of them and I insert them on the same manifold, I get just one operator associated with the product of the two group elements. And I have these charged operators that are maybe higher dimensional and they can create charged objects. So just like an ordinary local operator can create a point like particle that has a one dimensional world line that extends through time. Um, if I have the, the case of a one form symmetry, I have I have charge operators that live on lines like Wilson lines, and they can create strings that have two dimensional world sheets and, and so on. So I can get P plus one dimensional world volumes. And another useful fact about these global symmetries, the most familiar case is P equals zero when they act on local operators. But in fact, the less familiar cases are in some sense even easier uh, because the symmetries that act on local operators can be non-abelian. But the symmetries that act in this P bigger than zero case always have to be abelian. And that's really just a consequence of topology. So like if I have a, if I have a line operator and I'm surrounding it with things that live on some circles, um, um, sorry, am I saying that the wrong way? Um, right, if I surround the line with things that live on circles, I can sort of you know, expand the circle, drag it down below the other one and shrink it again and change the order of them. And, um, and so I can, I can commute them past each other without changing the topology. And therefore the symmetry has to be abelian. Um, whereas if we surround point operators by spheres, the only way I can shrink the sphere inside the other one is to make them cross. And so then, uh, then we can get the more general kinds of algebras for non-abelian groups. Okay, so these things have to be abelian. They're, they're all kind of simpler um, than our ordinary symmetries. And let me give you a concrete example. Um, there's a theory that we're all familiar with that has, that has a big global symmetry group, which is just the theory of a free photon, a free U1 gauge boson. And it has two different one form symmetries. One of them is associated with the field strength itself, the current F. F is closed, this is the Bianchi identity. And so if we don't have magnetic monopoles in the theory, we get a two form current which corresponds to a one-form symmetry. And the other current is star F, 
or F tilde. And this is a closed current if we have no electrically charged particles. And that leads in general to a global D minus three form symmetry. In 4D, these are both one form symmetries. And these symmetries um, are really just associated with the fact that uh, that you can measure the, the flux around a Wilson line or in a Tuft line. So the, the current star F is something under which the charged objects are Wilson loops. And the current F is something under which the charged objects are Tuft loops. And uh, one way to think about these symmetries is they're basi basically just counting the, the Wilson or Tuft loops or the total charge carried by Wilson or Tuft loops that, that they surround. Um, and that's true in the free Maxwell theory. But if we have charged particles, um, then we know that Maxwell's equations tell us d star f is not zero, it's the electric current. And that tells us that charged particles must explicitly break the symmetry. They violate the conservation law explicitly. And what that means in, in terms of this topological picture is if you try to surround a Wilson line with, with some sphere and measure the flux through the sphere, uh, the Wilson line can just end on a local operator that can make a charged particle. And so you can just kind of drag the, the sphere off the end of the Wilson line, and then it no longer sees the flux. And so the one form symmetry is explicitly broken if you have electrically charged particles. And the one form magnetic symmetry is explicitly broken if you have magnetic monopoles, which would mean that DF is not zero. Okay, so these are big symmetries of the free photon theory that cease to be symmetries if we start adding charge stuff to the theory. Are there any questions about that before I move on? Can you, is, is there a simple way to talk about the relation to linking numbers or should we save that for later? Um, what do you mean by that exactly? So there's these uh, higher form symmetries are related to linking numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you have electric and magnetic charges and there's a linking number between them, and when you do this operation with the linking number, it doesn't matter if you take the link over the end of the string because it's topological, so it doesn't change. Let's talk about it later. Yeah, okay. I'm confused by that statement. So um, I guess one thing I can say is that the, the statement I made here or here, um, right, I guess the, this one um, assumes that this charge operator, this charged operator V and the charge operator or symmetry operator U had linking number one when I said that it just appeared like the representation here. Um, so like in the case of a U1 theory, if you have something that carries charge Q, you get this phase that's just like e to the i alpha Q if they have linking number one. But if they have higher linking number, you would get e to the i alpha Q times the linking number. Um, okay, but I don't, I don't think I understood the thing about being able to take it off the end of the string. So maybe we can come back and talk about that more later. Okay, um, so, so, so far I've just been explaining things that, that go back to that 2014 paper by, um, by Gaioto and collaborators. But um, one thing that, that's happened recently is, is that these ideas have given us new ways to think about the Swampland conjectures. And um, in particular, there's a forthcoming paper by Clay Cordova, Kantaro Omori and Tom Rudelius uh, that I want to advertise um, because they, they've used this to, to kind of have a new way to think about what the weak gravity conjecture is. So the traditional viewpoint relating the weak gravity conjecture to the idea of no global symmetries was that um, there's a global symmetry you restore in gauge theory if you make the coupling very small. And so when we thought about quantum gravity having no global symmetries, that's the one we tended to focus on. And what they've pointed out is there are these other symmetries that become relevant if you don't necessarily have a small gauge coupling, but you don't have any charged stuff. And that's these one form symmetries. 
And so instead of imagining taking the coupling very small and thinking something could go wrong, I could also imagine taking all the charged stuff and making it super heavy. And again, thinking something might go wrong because then my, then my low energy theory will have this new uh, symmetry generated by the current star up if I don't have any charged stuff that can appear on the right hand side here. And so that's a different way to think about how you might be restoring a global symmetry, which quantum gravity doesn't like. And um, they tried to quantify this by, by coming up with a criterion where they, they suggest that what we really should ask is not just that quantum gravity has no global symmetries, but that every global symmetry in quantum gravity should be badly broken at the quantum gravity cutoff scale. So the quantum gravity cutoff scale, um, I'm using that language instead of Planck scale because it might be like the higher dimensional Planck scale or something. It's the scale where gravity becomes strongly coupled. And we know that we can have really good approximate symmetries at low energies in theories of quantum gravity. So we use this all the time with like axions. They have really good approximate shift symmetries at low energy, um, even though we don't really believe quantum gravity can have true global symmetries. But what they say is any, any approximate symmetry you see in a gravitational theory should somehow be a, kind of an accidental symmetry in your low energy theory. But if you go to high energies, it should get badly broken by something. And in the context of these one form symmetries, they then define what it means to be badly broken, which is that um, what it means to have a symmetry is that the correlation functions are topological. And so what it means to badly break the symmetry is the correlation functions are really far from being topological. And they quantify that by saying, let me imagine calculating some correlation function where I um, like surround some Wilson line with a, with a sphere and I vary the size of the sphere. And if it was purely topological, I would just get the same answer no matter what the size of the sphere is. But, um, but since the symmetry is broken, I won't. I'll have scale dependence in this correlation function. And so they propose that what it means to be badly broken is the logarithmic derivative of this correlation function with respect to the radius of the sphere should be order one at the Planck scale. And what they argue is, okay, if I put in any charged particle, I break the symmetry explicitly because something appears on the right-hand side of that equation, d star f is now electric current. But just putting something on the right-hand side doesn't necessarily badly break the symmetry because if I just have like one charged particle, um, its effect on this correlator appears only through loops and is order alpha over four pi. So if the coupling is small, um, I've broken the symmetry mildly, but not badly. And so basically what they say is I need, I need these particles running in the loops to add up to a big enough effect to make the radius dependence really strong. And that is basically equivalent to saying the loop effects have to be big which is equivalent to saying that as I go to the UV and reach this cutoff scale, my theory has to be driven to strong coupling. And so in that way, their criterion sort of maps to the same sort of things that Ben and Tom and I talked about before in the context of these stronger versions that we gravity conjecture with towers of particles. But I really like this formulation that Clay and Contaro and Tom have because it sounds so plausible. You know, it's not, um, the, the only input is sort of saying quantum gravity should at the Planck scale, quantum gravity should have no approximate global symmetry. And what they then argue is you get out these statements that you need like large numbers of particles running in loops and driving things to strong coupling. So I think that's a really useful illustration of how um, broadening our idea of what global symmetries can be in the way that Gaioto and collaborators did uh, can give us new ways to think about some of these swampland ideas um, that are different from the way people have been thinking about them for the last 15 years. Okay, so that's the end of the second part of my talk. Are, are there any other questions about this part for now? So if this is true, there have to be a big tower of bonopoles at the quantum gravity scale. Monopoles are trickier. Um, because uh, right, if, if you have if you have weakly coupled things, then you can argue the way they're doing, where you just think about the charged particles running in loops, and you say the correlators don't get big corrections. Um, the monopoles you you expect to be heavy compared to the cutoff usually, um, 
but they're also strongly coupled, so they can kind of still have big effects. So I, I don't know if they've tried to explicitly calculate things and figure that out. That, that's a, that's something that should be done, and I, I'm and not aware of cyber Witten, of course, where the monopoles are light and weakly coupled. Sure. Right, and that, then from that point of view, they would behave more like just ordinary electrically charged particles from the point of view of this argument, I think. So I, I think, well, I guess the, right, the problem there is if you're, if you're UV, I mean, this is really a statement about what should happen as you approach the, the cutoff scale. And so if your gauge group is changing, um, then I guess you really should be asking about the UV gauge group when you ask these questions. But, um, right. but yeah. So if it's an asymptotically free SUN, where am I? String well, theory think, has to save me. Right. I think the statement is it's not, it's only asymptotically free at low energies. And then when you get the high enough energies, you start seeing all the string states that live in crazy representations and they drive the theory to strong coupling. But then it doesn't really constrain phenomenology. Um, well, in some cases it could. If, I mean, if you. Anyway, I don't want to derail the talk again because I've done that enough times. So okay. <laughs> let's go on. If you assume that you have towers that sort of build up to big representations slowly, then, then it can still constrain phenomenology. I, I guess the tricky thing is if you just tell me, suddenly I, I hit a 5 million dimensional representation of SU2 and that immediately drives it to strong coupling, um, then, then that doesn't give you a useful constraint. But um, yeah, so, so somehow you, you, need, you need some other ingredients that go slightly beyond what you can get just directly from this argument. Okay, but yeah, so I will I will try to let's see. It's already I don't have that much time left. Okay, so so I'll try to I'll try to briefly uh, summarize the third part of the talk, which is about the recent work we've been doing on what we call Chern Bay global symmetries. Um, and these are really just trying to generalize this this case I was telling you about where you have symmetries generated by field strengths. And so um, the observation is just that there's a mathematical fact that if F is a closed form, we, we saw in the U1 context, that means you get the symmetry associated with the absence of magnetic monopoles. Um, if F is a closed form, then F wedge F is also a closed form. And so is F wedge F wedge F. Um, and so those are additional symmetries. Those are additional conserved currents that generate symmetries. And those symmetries are generally going to be um, some sort of higher form symmetry. Um, in five dimensions, F wedge F is a four form current, which generates an ordinary global symmetry because instantons are sort of point like objects. Um, but in higher dimensions, this would be one of these more general symmetries. And um, even more interestingly, this statement is also true in non abelian gauge theories. So F itself is not gauge invariant in a non abelian gauge theory, but F wedge F, taking the trace of F wedge F, does give you something gauge invariant. And um, D of the trace of F wedge F turns out to be the trace of the um, covariant derivative of F wedge F. And the covariant derivative of F is zero by the Bianchi identity. So trace F wedge F in any non-abelian gauge theory uh, is a closed form, meaning it generates a symmetry. And this, um, this way of phrasing it is not something people have done a lot, although it has occasionally been discussed in the literature, but it's not really an unfamiliar concept because you know uh, that there's some charge associated with this trace F wedge F, which is just instanton number. And so um, it maybe shouldn't be surprising that there's a, there's a symmetry structure there. And this is true for any number of Fs. I could do trace of F wedge F wedge F for you know, arbitrary numbers. As long as I'm in high enough numbers of dimensions that it makes sense to talk about that anti-symmetric product, I, I could take any number of copies of F. And so I have this whole set of symmetries that appear for any gauge theory that just follow from Bianchi identities. And th this, these are what we call Chern-Bay symmetries. 
Um, because basically Chern and Vey were the people who pointed out that there was this abstract mathematical concept of a characteristic class, but it could be represented by these very concrete formulas involving curvatures like F. Um, so, so the mathematics, the, the observations that these things are, are closed forms um, is mathematics that predates Young Mills theory. It's from sometime in the 1940s. And um, what we want to do then is just ask if these symmetries appear whenever we have gauge theories, um, but we've been told that quantum gravity doesn't like to have symmetries, then how do we square those things? How, how does it make sense? that gauge theory wants to have the symmetry and quantum gravity doesn't. And yet we know that quantum gravity and gauge theory can go hand in hand sometimes. So, so what's going on? Um, and there's no easy way to break this. You know, Unlike the, the F symmetry where we could just say if magnetic monopoles exist, this is broken. If you do this with like trace F wedge F, there's no easy thing that you can just point to something that's obviously going to break the symmetry. And so, um, so we kind of believe that, that these symmetries have to be broken, but it's not quite obvious how they're going to be broken. And in four dimensions, this is sort of a special case because trace F wedge F is a four form. Every four form is closed. So it's sort of a trivial statement to say that this is a, a symmetry. Um, nonetheless, if it's gauged, there is a meaning to that. We would say this is a D of something else. That's a meaningful statement. Um, and even if it's not gauged, we think there's sort of some way in which you can call this a minus one form symmetry. It has special properties. The integral of this thing is an integer. It's not just any random number. So this is somehow more special than ordinary four forms. But if you really want to hold me to being precise about things that I can, I can really define in a meaningful way, we could just talk about theories in five dimensions or higher where all of this makes more sense. So how does quantum gravity avoid these symmetries? And um, before I talk about quantum gravity, let me, let me tell you a story about quantum field theory. And this is a story that goes back to the 70s. Um, so this is certainly, everything I'm going to say is really well known, um, but I think what we have is just a slightly different angle on, on thinking about it that, at least to me, made, made various things I knew before sort of fit together more nicely. And so let's talk about SU2 gauge theory with an adjoint so we can Higgs it to U1. And we know that this theory contains a monopole, the Utopolyakov monopole. And we started with an non-abelian gauge theory. So it has a symmetry which is generated by trace F wedge F. So D of trace F wedge F is zero. That means we have a symmetry in the theory. But in the infrared, we have a U1 gauge theory. And if I just sort of naively match this operator trace F wedge F, it's gonna match onto F wedge F in the IR. Um, but D F in the IR is not zero because DF is only zero when there are no magnetic monopoles. And we know there's a magnetic monopole in this theory. So DF wedge F is the monopole current wedge F and that operator is not zero. So we started with the symmetry in the UV and we don't have a symmetry in the IR. And what bothers me about that, yeah, let me say that before I move on to the next slide. What bothers me about that is I could imagine gauging the symmetry. So I can imagine taking a gauge field and coupling it to this current trace F wedge F. Okay, some other external gauge field, not these SU2 or U1 gauge fields. Um, and if that gauge field couples to trace F wedge F in the UV, then it couples to F wedge F in the IR. But I just told you F wedge F is not conserved. And gauge fields are not allowed to couple to things that aren't conserved. So there's a puzzle, you know, what happens? How is this theory consistent? And the answer goes back to, to physics that was understood by Jakiev and others in the mid 70s, which is that the Yatov Polyakov monopole has um, a set of zero modes. And the obvious zero modes are the ones where you just take the monopole and move it around. Um, or if you're in a higher dimensional theory, like in 5D, a monopole um, is a string, you have the, the Nambu Goldstone modes that live on the string world sheet that let it wiggle around. But there's another kind of less obvious. Uh, mode, which in high enough dimensions you can think of as a different kind of Nambu Goldstone boson, which is what happens when you do a, a gauge symmetry, a gauge transformation um, that doesn't vanish at infinity. So there are SU2 gauge transformations that act like sort of global U1 rotations at infinity. Um, and because they're non-vanishing at infinity, you should really think of them as uh, 
taking you to different states in the theory. They're not, they're not like true gauge transformations that, that don't change the state. Um, these really do take one state to another state. And what these transformations do is they, they produce a scalar boson, uh, which is a periodic scalar that lives on the monopole world volume. And in the 4D case, the monopole is just a point-like particle. Its world line, its, its world volume is just a one-dimensional world line. So it's a theory of quantum mechanics. And so this is the quantum mechanics of a particle uh, whose coordinate just lives on a circle. And that's a familiar quantum mechanical system. And it has eigenstates that are labeled by integers, which are basically how many units of momentum does that particle have around its circle. And it turns out those integers correspond to electric charges that the monopole can acquire. So if you excite this mode, what was purely a magnetically charged object becomes a dion that has both magnetic charge and electric charge. And there's a high, higher dimensional generalization, generalization of this, which is that the monopole world volume theory contains a compact scalar degree of freedom, um, which kind of lets you dissolve electric charge inside the monopole. And the upshot of all this is that we can gauge this current in the UV and that means there's a new current in the IR, which is not just F wedge F, but it's F wedge F plus some delta function localized thing that lives on the monopole world volume. That's what this monopole current is basically doing is giving us the delta functions times the covariant derivative D of the scalar. So, so the scalar shifts when you do a U1 gauge transformation. It's like a Stuckelberg mass kind of on the monopole. Um, and on the monopole, D of this thing, this covariant derivative of the scalar, just equals F. And so when I take D of this whole thing, here D of one of the Fs turns into the monopole current, but here D of this thing turns into F and they cancel each other and the whole thing is conserved. Okay, so it's consistent to gauge it because there is a conserved current in the IR theory. It's just that the conserved current in the IR theory is not the obvious thing that you see in the bulk that turns out not to be conserved. It's this combination of a bulk thing and a localized thing that's conserved. And so if we didn't have that localized degree of freedom, we wouldn't be able to make sense of the story. And that localized degree of freedom also plays a role in another familiar physical phenomenon, which is the Witten effect, which is that if I turn on some background value of theta coupled to trace F wedge F, then I shift the charges in the theory so that my magnetic monopole becomes a dion whose electric charge is proportional to its magnetic charge and to theta. And this theta, you can think of it as an axion from the 4D point of view, some background axion that I turned on. Um, but axions from this perspective are kind of like a zero dimensional, a zero form version of a gauge field. So periodic scalars are sort of like the, the zero form version of, of gauge fields. Um, and there's also higher dimensional generalizations of this. So this could be some gauge field in higher dimensions. Uh, and if you turn on a background value for it, you would, you would sort of uh, find that your magnetic monopole world volume carries electric charge dissolved inside it. So all of this fits together really nicely. And, and all these things about these dion degrees of freedom and the Witten effect, uh, from this point of view, one way to find them is to think about the churn bay symmetry and ask how can it be consistent to gauge it? And this is just the only way it can be consistent. Um, now it turns out that there's a whole slew of generalizations of this that show up in string theory. So you know that like D brains in string theory have gauge fields that live on their world volumes. It turns out those gauge fields are doing a similar job to this scalar sigma. And so um, again, there are ways to sort of infer that all the structure has to be there by starting with these churn bay symmetries in the bulk and asking what happens to them. And if the thing that happens to them is that they are gauged uh, through churn Simon's terms like this, some gauge field coupled to our current, um, the only way that can be consistent is to have degrees of freedom that live on the brain world volumes. In the brain case, the gauge fields are massless, but sigma cost some finite energy to excite it. Right, so, so this is a, I think you asked me that in a previous iteration of this talk and I didn't have a good answer for you. Um, I think I have a slightly better answer now, but maybe, maybe still not a perfect answer, which is that um, 
sigma costs energy to excite, as you said. Um, but it doesn't have a mass term. So, so the quantum mechanics of a particle in a circle, we, we haven't written a mass for sigma, but we get this spectrum of, we get this discrete spectrum of states of the quantum mechanics theory. And um, that's kind of because we're not in high enough numbers of dimensions. So we have the uh, Coleman, Merman, however many names I'm supposed to attach to this uh, thing that, that tells us we can't spontaneously break symmetries in low numbers of dimensions. So there's not actually this continuum of states that are connected to each other by turning on this field. Um, but if you're in high enough numbers of dimensions, there should be. So if I went to 60 at least, um, then I really do have just a massless Nambu Goldstone boson that lives on the monopole world volume and it costs no energy to excite. Um, and at least most of the cases of D-brains are similar. So you can think of the gauge field on the D-brain world volume as a Nambu Goldstone boson for a spontaneously broken one form global symmetry of the world volume theory, um, which is associated to gauge transformations of the B field, the string B field and the bulk. Um, and they don't cost any energy if you're in, if you're in sufficiently high dimensions. Um, I guess what I don't, what I don't actually know is exactly how to think about the gauge field on a sufficiently low dimensional D brain, where I can't really think of it as a true number Goldstone boson because I'm in low enough numbers of dimensions that there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, but, but I think that finite energy cost is sort of an artifact of being in too low a number of dimensions and it goes away in most of the examples. Okay, um, I'm already a little bit over time. So um, maybe I should just briefly sum up a couple of other points and then, then if people wanna ask more questions, they can. Um, Right, so, so I guess just, just to summarize, uh, what we find is that in string theory, most of these new symmetries, I mean, they're not really new. Again, the math goes back to the 1940s, but the things that we haven't been talking about as symmetries in the context of this conversation about whether quantum gravity has global symmetries or not, they're usually gauged. They're gauged by Chern-Simons kind of terms where some gauge field couples to trace up by Jeff. But there's usually more to the story. And so for instance, the gauge field usually also couples to other things. Like if you have this kind of current living on a D-brain, your gauge field usually also couples to some lower dimensional D-brains. And that means you've really only gauged one combination of possible currents. And so you should still ask what happened to the other combinations? Because if there's still some unbroken, if there's some other combination that is not gauged and that is not broken, then we would still have a global symmetry and we would still be violating this whole core. And so what we found is just sort of in every case that we can find these things and that we understand what's going on, people have already identified processes that break those other would-be symmetries. So one of those processes, for instance, is you can take an instanton that lives inside a D-brain and you can shrink it down below the string scale. And then it just becomes another lower dimensional D-brain that you can just kind of pull off the original brain. And that process converts instanton charge into lower dimensional D-brain charge, which breaks one linear combination of symmetries and the other combination is gauged. So, um, so, so that's the summary basically. We, we, we don't find any examples where these symmetries are symmetries of theories of quantum gravity where we really understand the theory well enough to, to say what's going on. In every case where we understand anything, um, these symmetries tend to be gauged and they the, the more correct statement is what tends to be gauged as a linear combination of this current and other stuff together with some set of physical processes that convert between the different charges carried by the different terms. And lots of different stringy effects, like the fact that one brain can end on another brain, turn out to be really important to make the story consistent. And so there's lots of stuff happening in string theory that I might have thought was just an artifact of people looking at highly supersymmetric theories under the lamppost and calculating things from this point of view, it seems like it's part of a bigger story where the theory is sort of doing what it has to do to eliminate symmetries that it doesn't want to have. Um, and 
just to point in the direction of phenomenology, um, you know, we can think about the 40 case where again, this thing is sort of some marginal case. I don't totally understand it, but you could still think of trace off wedge off as kind of being like a symmetry. And if it couples to a dynamical axion, that symmetry is gauged. And so it seems like the reason we find axions all over the place in string theory is they're doing a job and the job they have is to take some symmetry and gauge it. Um, okay, so just to conclude, um, there's this idea that, that if we didn't have particles of different charges, we would sometimes have leftover generalized global symmetries. Um, it seems like towers of particles guarantee not just that those symmetries are absent, but that they're badly broken to Planck scale. But then we also have these additional symmetries that come from currents that are higher copies of the field strength, multiples of different field strengths. And as far as we can tell, they are always gauged or broken. So they're never true symmetries in gravitational theories. And lots of the ingredients we see in string theory, like churn Simons, turns and axions seem like they might be doing this job for us. And I think a natural question raised by, by the set of things people have been doing is, uh, I'm telling you that these things are not actual symmetries, but it seems like we get more powerful results if we ask not just for symmetries to not exist at all, but for them to be badly broken at the Planck scale. And so what does it mean for these symmetries to be badly broken at the Planck scale? And can we use that to tell us things about axions? Um, I don't know the answer yet, but I think that is the fun next step to think about. So thanks. Okay, let's unmute and thank Matt. Anyone besides me have questions? Um, yeah, maybe can I just ask um, there, so there's, there's no reason in principle from this point of view why these churn vey symmetries couldn't just be badly broken at the Planck scale. Is that right? Or did it, but you, you seem to be finding that they're usually gauged. So, right. So Do you understand why they're not, is there some reason why they can't just be badly broken at the Planck scale? I don't think there's a reason that I understand. So, so right, what, what we've been doing really is just sort of surveying example theories that we understand and seeing what happens in them. And so um, one, one thing I could say is that there's sort of a clear difference between the abelian case and the, and the non-abelian case. Um, because in the abelian case, we could violate this identity just by having magnetic monopoles that make df not equal to zero. So I put some j on the right-hand side here, and then this thing is not zero. Um, so for abelian churn vey symmetries, you could imagine that they're just broken because monopoles exist, which we already think should be true in quantum gravity anyway. Um, and that would be the end of the story. In the actual examples, that doesn't seem to be the end of the story. There's usually more to it, which involve these localized degrees of freedom on the monopole, and there's usually still some sort of symmetry that's gauged. Um, but at least that's the case where, where you could imagine things are just broken. And, and in certain cases, they just are. So, so like for kaluza klein gauge theory, um, it turns out um, the localized degree of freedom doesn't exist because the kaluza klein monopole is translationally invariant around the circle in the extra dimension. And so you can't make it a dion because there's just no way to, to give it momentum along the extra dimension. It's, it's, you, you just, there, there's no zero mode associated with that because, because that just gets you back the same solution you started with. Um, so there are cases where it seems like some of these abelian churn based symmetries are just broken. But when we have non-abelian theories, um, the only way to violate this is to somehow violate the Bianchi identity. And it's sort of conceptually harder to figure out exactly what, what you would be doing there. Um, and we don't really find any example where you have a non-abelian uh, gauge theory and there is not some gauging that involves a linear combination of its trace F wedge F and other stuff. Um, now there are cases where some of these things are explicitly broken. And so one, one slide that I skipped over is if I had a gut, for instance, if I'm a low energy theorist, I think I have a different trace F wedge F for SU3 and for SU2. In the UV, there's only one trace F wedge F, which is for SU5. 
And so one of those linear combinations in my IR theory is an accidental symmetry that only exists in the IR and that's explicitly broken at the gut scale because I can take like an SU3 instanton and shrink it down to the gut scale and then rotate it and blow it up again as an SU2 instanton and see that there were really not two separate charges there. There was only one charge. Um, so that's one way it could be explicitly broken, but that still leaves me with at least one trace F wedge F in my theory. It just lets me reduce the number of them. Um, we don't know any example where there's a process in the UV that just totally violates this. But I think we also don't know any deep reason why that's true. I mean, I don't know why I couldn't imagine some theory where something weird happens at short distances that just makes instanton number completely an invalid concept and, and there would be no symmetry. Um, but empirically, just fishing around in corners of quantum field theory and quantum gravity that we understand, we don't know a way to do that for the non-abelian gauge theories. Another maybe kind of related question. Can you, can you, if, uh, can you measure the hair from this stuff in black holes? So if let's say a black hole is charged under one of these things, can you measure its hair? That's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't know the answer to. Um, it, it they people talked about. The I know that people talked about like Wilczek and Preskill, and people talked about this in the late eighties. I think other kinds of sort of topological, topolo you know, gauge, 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 uh, gauge symmetries that do not have local degrees of freedom. So then there are these phases, Aronoff-Bohm type phases around black holes that you can still see. Right. So I, you're right. So there are those old papers on, on like discrete gauge symmetries, for instance. Yeah, um, things like that. And I, I know that Gia Diwali and, and some collaborators had some papers a couple of years back on um, like skirmion hair for black holes, which seems sort of loosely similar. But I... I am not aware of anything about like instant on hair on black holes, but it, it's an interesting question. Um, because you know, if you if you, it seems like that would be kind of like a proof that you can't just break it at the Planck scale, right? Because then it's it's you pretty much it, you know, it. Uh, well, I don't know. It depends on how you measure it, but anyway, it might it's relevant. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So like. Like in five dimensions where instantons are just particles, you could imagine just having a black hole and throwing instantons into it and seeing what happens. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I think it would be fun to, to explore. Any other questions? You mentioned that this is using condensed matter. Uh, and, well, this is this appears in condensed matter. Um, yeah, I don't actually know a lot about that, but but I think I think like a, a lot of the um, th this language of generalized global symmetries has been used and people trying to understand these like symmetry protected topological phases and things like that. Um, I don't know, we, we have condensed matter theorists at Harvard who are into that stuff and even, even fancier versions of it with cobordism and all kinds of math I don't understand. Um, but, but like I think Kapustin got into it from that kind of direction doing more condensed matter theory. Than, and high energy theory. Okay, let's thank Matt again. Thanks.